Hi everyone, I'm just Isa, and welcome to Dark History of Sweden. This video is a bit late because I had to refilm and a lot of stuff happened, but it is finally here. And I do think that I might start uploading on Wednesdays instead, instead of Sundays. So if there's not a video this coming Sunday, expect it on Wednesday instead. If you don't like this, comment down below and let me know. I just think that I need more time to edit now because there is so much that I collect for my videos and it takes quite a while. <laughs> I'm pretty fast at editing, but just collecting everything, all the materials that I need, it takes time. So I think Wednesdays would be better for me, but we'll see. So yeah, and I look different because uh, I dyed my hair. And uh, I also, what else did I do? Yeah, I worked and uh, it's like 10 p.m. right now when I filmed this uh, and I have to get up at 6 tomorrow for work and uh, yeah and by the time you guys see this I'm now 27 uh, it is actually Tuesday today Tuesday the 20th of June and it's my birthday so I film I'm filming this on my birthday uh, just so you know. <laughs> Anyways, let's get into the video. Last time we talked about Bekombaya Asylum, but this time we are going to talk about some patients that lived there. If you haven't seen the video on Bekombaya Asylum, I highly recommend that you do, because there is information in that video that will be very important to the patient's history. So that will be up in the corner and in the description and maybe at the end of this video as well. So yeah, check that out. And while you're at it and you like my content, make sure you are subscribed and hit that bell so you don't miss a video. I upload when I can, <laughs> almost every week. Let's get into the patience. There aren't many known patients of Bekombaya Asylum. I couldn't find any records online. They might be at the Public Records Office in Stockholm, which I can't get a hold of because I need to be in Stockholm, which I am not. But I have gathered the information I can about two known and quite famous uh, patients of Bekombaya Asylum. Interestingly enough, they are both women. Sigrid Jartén was born October 27, 1885 in Sundsvall to parents Svante Jartén and Maria Ram. She also had a little brother, Gustav, born in 1886. Her mother died of tuberculosis in 1888 and her father remarried in 1897 with Tora Östberg, who used to work as their housekeeper. During her childhood, they moved around a lot. The first time it was because they lost their house in the Great Sundsvall Fire in 1888. Jartén studied at Higher Industrial Art Academy in Stockholm and graduated as a drawing master in 1908. But in 1910, after the urging of her husband, Isaac Grinewald, who she met at an art exhibition in 1909, she traveled to Paris to study under the renowned artist Henri Matisse. According to some sources, she was one of his favorite students, but some say it's a myth derived from one of her co-workers, Karl Palmes, who once said that Matisse had praised her artwork. Yartén is famous for her coloristic sense and the way she used warm and cold colors against each other. But she was also heavily criticized as a cheap copy of her husband. Albert Engström, editor-in-chief of Strix magazine, said her work was idiotic and that she seemed to have a perverse craving for everything deformed. 
her last few paintings were intense portrayals of mental illness. 1931, Jaten, her husband, and their son Ivan moved back to Sweden. Here, her mental health started to decline and she had depressive episodes. And in 1936, she even stopped painting because of it. She arrived at Beckenbach Asylum that same year. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia and they tried many different therapies, but none of them helped. At the age of 62 in 1948, Jaten died during a failed lobotomy. She was buried April 2nd in Skuxa graveyard in Saltfabaden. Lonnie Nelly Sachs was born December 10th, 1891 in Berlin. Nelly didn't have an easy life with her Jewish heritage and living through World War II. Her parents were George William Sachs and Margarete Sachs. They were manufacturers of natural rubber and gutta perka. I think that's how you pronounce it. Gutta perka, gutta perka, something like that. They were well off and lived a good life. Nelly was homeschooled due to poor health as a child. This made it so that she grew up being a very introverted and sheltered woman. Nelly was very good friends with both Swedish author Selma Lagerlöf and the German poet Hilde Dunin. They sent many letters to each other throughout the years. And when World War II started, Lagerlöf made sure Nelly and her mother were allowed into Sweden. By talking to the Swedish royal family, she could secure Nelly and her mother's escape from Germany to Sweden in 1940. And just one week before Nelly was supposed to be taken to a concentration camp, they left on the last flight. Because of all the trauma and fright from the war, Nelly actually lost her ability to speak for a while. And she wrote about it in a poem. When the Great Terror came, I fell dumb. Nelly took care of her mother for years while living in a small two-room apartment in Stockholm. They barely survived by Nelly translating texts from Swedish and German. After her mother's death, Nelly suffered from nervous breakdowns with the symptoms, hallucinations, paranoia, and delusions of being persecuted by the Nazis. This led to her being hospitalized at Beckenbaya Asylum. One thing that triggered one of her worst breakdowns was when she heard spoken German during a trip to Switzerland to accept a literary award she had won. But she was very forgiving to younger Germans and corresponded with several German writers like Hans Magnus Ensenbaya and Ingeboy Bachmann. She continued to write during her stay at Beckenbaya and even won the Nobel Prize in 1966. Not only that, but Nelly was a renowned spokesperson for both the persecuted Jews and those who survived. Nelly did eventually recover enough to live on her own, but her mental health continued to be fragile. She lived alone until her death on the May 12th of 1970 at the age of 78. That was all I had on some of the well-known patients of Beckenbaya Asylum. There are many stories going around, but nothing that is confirmed to be true. So that is why I decided not to have that in the video. Before I end the video, I want to know if you guys enjoy learning about the patients that stayed at these asylums and prisons that I have talked about. Um, should I continue to do these types of videos about the patients or do you only want about the places? And should I do two separate videos? Like one for the asylum slash prison slash whatever and one for the patients or inmates? Or should I do one big video? What do you think? Comment down below. Let me know. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like, 
subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss another video. Take care of each other and yourselves and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!